Hello, hello. Thank you to everyone who watched that last video, gave me feedback. Um, Y'all helped me realize that I'm not explaining at all what I'm doing. I have never seen this annual report before recording right now. And I want to make it entertaining to go through it together, explain my thinking, uh, point out what I pay attention to and what I'm not paying attention to, and really just make it fun to go through these business reports and these annual reports that businesses put a lot of effort into providing for potential or already existing investors. And really, you can learn a lot about what's happening by what companies are collecting and focusing on. A business focused on one thing is going to be completely different and have a completely different set of statistics that they collect to share with their investors than another business. Really, it's about making it more accessible and fun. If the idea can be tweaked, let's tweak it. Really grateful for the feedback I've received so far, though. Definitely looking forward to seeing continued feedback. Don't forget to like and subscribe so I get you more comfortable with this 10K so your wisdom can blossom. I have here the Form 10K for Apple Incorporated, a California company. What's interesting about today is Apple is probably one of the most recognized companies in the world. It's very difficult to not already have some prejudices or knowledge about Apple before looking at this. And as financial sages, we want to limit our prejudices before we look into a 10K or any other type of financial report because we want to find the story that the numbers are telling. In fact, I pulled up beforehand uh, it's over $3 trillion, very first, for, to my knowledge, $3 trillion company. Keeping this in mind, what we're really asking ourselves when we're about to look at these numbers then is, we know this is the most expensive company in the world. Is it really worth $3 trillion? Let's find out. Looking at the table of contents of this annual report, it's always going to have the same parts and the same items. This is something that any public company listed in any of the major exchanges has to adhere to, otherwise they will get kicked off of the exchange. Typically, you're going to find in part one, all of the words, <laughs> essays basically, essays from CFO office, from the CEO himself, from the operations office, just essay after essay after essay. Any of that we will look into if it becomes relevant to the story that we're uncovering in the numbers. Now the numbers actually only exist in one of these items, uh, technically two actually, they're in the summary as well. But I look at the item eight, the financial statements and supplementary data. We can summarize this as the numbers. Hopefully there's another table of contents here that Apple is providing within their item eight, these are all going to be the standard reports that they have to prepare. Now, the specifics of how they prepare these reports is going to be unique to every company, somewhat stable across industries, but basically unique. The main breakdown of these financial statements is that there are three of them. An income statement, a balance sheet, and a statement of cash flows. Let's just go through those three. That is going to be the starting opener First up, we have the income statement. This statement is always prepared for a company to the governments that are going to charge it taxes. It's as simple as that. I'm a company. I have to pay taxes. This is what the taxes I think I should pay are. And so you're always going to see on every single income statement, something like provision for income taxes, how much money came in, how much money came out for different reasons and how much money was left. Net income is how much money was left. Those are often then broken down into how much of that income is per share, which is important as an investor potentially in shares. And then the money coming out usually is broken down into cost of sales and operating expenses. Cost of sales really means who supplied you with what you need to do business. Operating expenses really means what did you need to do in addition to having the product in order to get that product into customers' hands? For the purposes of these walkthroughs, we want to see if trends are happening, if they're continuing, or if maybe they're changing. To look for a changing trend, first I'm going to get familiar with what columns they gave me, annual versus quarterly, things like that. 
here we have three years. Everything is just steady rising. Now my eyeball gravitates towards this difference and this difference on the net income. Net income two years ago to last year grew a lot faster than last year to this year, which is not exactly reflected in the gross margin. Right here, there were similar gaps between two years to last year and last year to this year. That means the difference is in the operating expenses, which would happen between these. What's happening is operating expenses are growing faster than everything else. Now, this information alone doesn't form a trend that we have to remember right away. But this could potentially be a red flag. And so what I'm taking away from this first statement is look into why selling general and administrative expenses is potentially growing faster this year than everything else. Otherwise, this is just a healthy company that's making a little bit more money every year. In addition to the income statement, there's usually a consolidated statement. Everything in this statement has some sort of connection to a tax code. Whether it's derivative instruments, marketable debt securities, these are things that they can treat differently for tax purposes, and so they take in out of the basic income statement. Over time, you expect older companies to have more and more things in their consolidated income statement. Companies have lawyers to find out what tax codes might apply to their business. Apple definitely counts as a company. I mean, as the biggest company in the world, I'm sure they have lawyers very familiar with tax codes. In fact, this is a really nice comprehensive income, probably one of the nicest we'll ever see in terms of even though there's a lot going on, it's clearly organized and been simplified. Change in fair value of derivative instruments, this is actually pretty broad. What they define as changes in fair value could encompass all sorts of things that they've simplified for us at this level. We could get the specifics if we want to, but really I'm just focused on they're not huge differences. Sometimes there's no change. Sometimes there's a bit of an increase in income. Sometimes there's a bit of a decrease. Moving on to the balance sheet. This is the snapshot. These values are changing daily, usually, especially for a company like Apple. However, on September 24th, September 25th, once a year, basically, we get to see the snapshot. Removing ourselves from the day-to-day, -day, we're going to see trends about what the company is doing and what it owns and owes. Interestingly, there's less marketable securities. We saw that in the consolidated income that those were decreasing in fair value. The combined impact of these two rows, still pretty much not a worry, not a red flag. Retained earnings has dipped slightly negative. Now, some people might think, how could Apple not have retained any earnings? That's a very fair question. What it actually means though is they've paid out all the earnings very efficiently to shareholders. A little bit of negative retained earnings means they might have overdone it a bit. In particular, this is so small. It could have been the change in debt marketable securities alone that made them go negative. But they're basically close to zero here, meaning that every dollar Apple earns, it's basically gotten to the point where it's given that dollar back to shareholders Investors love it. Doesn't surprise me that this company is $3 trillion when I can see that they're so focused on returning money back to shareholders. Clearly their shares are expensive because investors know Apple is currently giving out money. The time between when they purchase a share and they receive money back, I mean like this year, it's still not a lottery ticket. The consolidated statement of cash flows, net income rising, generated by operating activities rising as well. One interesting thing is that their cash generated grew faster than their net income, mainly because some vendors that owed them money paid back a good amount of money this year. So even though the debt securities had a bit of a fair value impairment with rising interest rates and all that, or who knows what the specifics are, Apple's got a lot of people that need to pay them for things. One thing to note is, their marketable securities were going down in value to the point of impacting fair value. But Apple did not shy away from purchasing a lot of them. Sure, they purchased a little bit less than what they had in previous years. But their purchase of marketable securities is still comparable to all the cash they made just two years ago.
something very exciting to notice as well is look at these repurchases of common stock. It's very high. This right here is how you can see retained earnings easily staying close to zero. Every dollar they receive from business, they put into repurchasing common stock. They put into purchasing other securities from other businesses. Honestly, this is a row or two away from looking like the financial statement of a bank more than any other sort of company. Apple, I don't think of as a bank really, yet it's clearly being run like a bank. It's kind of fascinating that the most expensive company in the world is basically a bank that has a lot of marketing and consumer love. Hey everyone, don't forget to like and subscribe if you're becoming more comfortable with uncovering the stories behind these numbers. Gathering more from an Apple provided note on financial instruments, we can see that this is becoming more and more bank-like. They've broken down their financial instrument reserves, their marketable securities as they were referring to them in the other statements, into levels. Apple is investing in mutual funds, U.S. treasuries, money market funds, commercial paper, corporate debt, mortgage-backed securities, quite a lot of corporate and mortgage-backed securities, which is interesting because on a relative basis, usually banks have to have more of the safer stuff like the level one in the levels and up here in, in the treasury securities. Apple does not have the same regulations for the sake that it's not officially a bank. Let's look at one, two, three. Let's find these subscripts. Level one, fair value estimates based on quoted prices in active markets for identical assets or liabilities. Level two, fair value estimates based on observable inputs other than quoted prices in active markets. This is bank stuff. Interest rate risk to protect the company's term debt and or marketable securities from fluctuations in interest rates. The company may enter into interest rate swaps, options, or other instruments. The differences between level one and level two being related to liquidity. If you can get quoted price very easily, that means you can probably sell or trade, either buy or sell, I guess, that asset pretty easily. That would be liquid. This is worded not like the way a bank would word it, but this is kind of the same idea of why banks are regulated. This last part of note two, subscript two, is why treasury securities are counted as level two. Here it says, um, or can be corroborated by observable market data for substantially the full term of the assets or liabilities. And so if they're holding it or planning to hold it fully, never sell it, they'll include it into level two. That, um, sorry, I was looking at the wrong one there. Going back to the latest here, that implies that they're saying these treasury securities, um, they could, they're expecting to hold until the securities expire, basically for the whole life of the financial asset. That's interesting. So differences to banks, for sure. Um, most of the differences are not in the big picture ideas, though. The differences are in the little minutia where a bank being regulated isn't allowed to do stuff like this. Apple not being regulated as a bank is allowed to do things like this, which I'm not saying it should be regulated like a bank. It's a very different company than a bank, of course. They're just behaving, especially in recent years, in some ways similar to how you would expect banks to behave. Let's find where these marketable securities are having the impact in terms of money coming in or being paid out. It wouldn't be included in net sales. This is broken down into products and services, which we might have to look into to define, but really it should be in this other income slash expense. And as we were seeing, 2022 is not a good year for their marketable securities business. It's not a bank. I'm exaggerating when I call it a bank, but it's not not a bank while it's trying to decide what to do, but they're dealing with a hundred billion plus at this point. That's larger than many, many real banks. There's a really strong business here that grows still, surprisingly, despite having huge numbers that few companies will ever dream of being able to reach. It's still growing pretty modestly, but growing. Does Apple, which is clearly thinking about some sort of 
flexibility right now. Accelerate growth in products, in services, or in their other income. All options could reasonably happen in the future. Is Apple gaining from the flexibility of owning and managing so many marketable securities? Is that worth it? From time to time, there are financial collapses. Apple is kind of secretly become a very giant bank-like entity. Does it really have the risk controls that other banks, or sorry, not other banks, but that real banks would need to have in place in order to be of that size and operate freely? Is Apple prepared for any of that? Certainly would be too late to prepare after a financial hiccup is happening. In the meantime, if anything happens, Apple will have a very, very solid ongoing business that is really the core of what is happening here. Looking just at the numbers, it's actually most interesting isn't at all what looks to be the most impactful in the first statement. Really what is changing in the last couple of years is not anything to do with the core business, with the core research and development, or with the general operations. What's really changing is Apple is spending more and more of its human resources, of its SGNA, on managing marketable securities. Those marketable securities aren't having a significant impact on the bottom line yet. Maybe this doesn't this stays irrelevant for a very long time. However, they're gaining the flexibility of if research and development doesn't hit on something huge, huge in terms of impacting the the top part of this statement, then we could see other income become a more prominent part of the Apple business. Very interesting that they're in a situation where they're prioritizing flexibility at such a massive scale. I called it a bank a couple times. It's basically a bank hidden within the wonderful business that so many people recognize. While we're digesting, I want to take the opportunity to share some of the YouTube channels that I've been watching over the years. Today, I'd like to share the channel Potato McWhiskey, which will be linked in the description. This is a gaming channel. Um, he kind of, I think, pioneered some of the, the concepts of Let's Plays, how I enjoy them. Many, many people pioneered Let's Plays, of course, to be fair. But he's one of my personal favorites. I really like his spin on Let's Plays, where he really takes game mechanics to the extreme. It's strategic. It's funny at times. It's overall just a good time. Please check out Potato Book Whiskey. I hope it's been fun to look into a company that many, many people recognize, but that frankly, after seeing the numbers, I don't recognize at all compared to what I thought I knew about it. That's the wonderful part of these financial statements. Companies have to be honest and transparent in here. They can give them names, different companies can use different headers, different columns, all these other things, but eventually we can uncover what they're actually focusing on, what they're actually doing. Please like and subscribe, and in general, share your wisdom.